Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Prime Talk. Today, I have a really cool guest. I have Anthony Cofrancesco. Uh, he's the industry liaison for uh, PicFu, which is a very interesting company. It's a leading consumer feedback service. Uh, we're probably going to discuss and touch that uh, more later. But uh, in the meantime, Anthony, welcome to the show. Hey, Yoni. Thanks so much for having me on. A pleasure. I see that you are standing or sitting. I'm standing. I usually, whenever I do these, I, I prefer to stand. Yeah. Wow. You're the first one, I think, in my show to, that's standing. That's awesome. Uh, anyway, so how you been? Where are you located right now? So I, I mean, I've been pretty good, as good, I think, as everyone can be with all this COVID craziness going on. Right now, I'm in Maryland, a little town called Havre de Grace. I, uh, I'm normally based full-time in Manila, Philippines, but uh, I got stuck on, traveling on the way to a conference and uh, have been here for the past few months. Didn't think it would be so long. Manila, Philippines. Interesting. I think I bet it's a, quite a story and hopefully we'll get there. So, so you're going to share with us, um, you know, your background, who are you, where are you from, where'd you grow up, where'd you go to school, how'd you begin your career? You know, you're going to take us uh, to the adventure of you. So I guess without further ado, there you go. Shoot, go ahead. Alrighty. So, I mean, I guess, I guess my background just kind of just starting off is uh, you know, I grew up in, in a small town in Maryland. I, I grew up, went to a pretty small high school and, um, you know, er, early on, I, I guess, I guess where my, my career really started was going to college, right? So I went to the University of Florida. Uh, when I first went to college, I thought I was going to be a doctor, which is kind of crazy to say out loud now. Going what kind in, of doctor? Did you know what, what, what kind of doctor? Who knows? I, I didn't really even know very much. I just knew that doctors made money. <laughs> and uh, I thought that's what I was going to do. So I, I went down to the University of Florida and sorely mistaken right off the bat that that was not going to be a fit doing chemistry and biology and different things like that. Um, so I ended up kind of switching into a business major uh, in accounting and finance. And, you know, pretty much the, the thing that really hit me right off the bat is I, uh, I was doing these different internships. And, uh, you know, at the time, I thought I wanted to be the next big CFO of America. That was like my, my big dream is to go and become a corporate exec. And, uh, you know, I had I'd done these different internships when I was in college. And at some point, I started getting into the world of entrepreneurship and small business owners. While I was still in college, I was, uh, you know, I had the opportunity to present in front of the CFO of Verizon and the entire financial executive team. And uh, then I started to get into small businesses. And so the first real experience I had was with a company called The Points Guy. Um, it's a travel hacking website. And uh, they're still the time, around. They're, they're pretty huge now, no? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that, that was kind of my first jump into it. And, uh, you know, a lot of people ask me, like, how I was able to get into that role. And, you know, at the time, like I was saying, I, I was doing the whole corporate thing, but I was also traveling a lot whenever I could, whenever I could skip class, I was getting on a plane, trying to find cheap flights, cheap hotels. And so I reached out to the points guy and uh, I sent them like maybe 20 emails just over and over. Hey, I think your website's so cool. You don't even have to pay me. I just want to like, you know, I just want to help out any way I can. And uh, eventually I ended up getting in touch with uh, someone who got me in touch to the points guy and I actually ended up landing a job there. Uh, where, where are they based out of? Uh, at the time they were based in New York and this is, this was, they were working out of a WeWork office. This was still like when they were only maybe five or six employees. And what year was this? Oh man, this must have been maybe four or five years ago at this point. So around 2015-ish? Yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. Okay, so you're in Florida, correct me if I'm wrong? Yep. Okay, they're in New York City. Um, by nudging them, you secured a job. And what was your position there? So I was just pretty much an intern, right? I was writing some articles. I was, I guess they called me a, a strategy intern. So I was looking a little bit of article writing, doing reviews on airlines and hotels. But then I was also getting to do, uh, looking into our customer LTV and see the, the traffic on the website and kind of attributing that to, because uh, it's a, just a credit card affiliate business, right? And so they make money when people sign up for the credit card. So kind of uh, looking at the content plan and seeing uh, how we could go and increase the, the, you know, the affiliate commissions that we were getting for the site. And how'd it go? How, many, how long did you stay there? It was really, really good. You know, that was my first experience going felt something that was different from the corporate side of things. And, you know, Verizon was a really cool experience because it was such a big company, but the points guy was completely different. It was so much smaller. Um, you know, who the is the was, points guy? Well, give him a shout out. What's his name? Brian Kelly. Brian Kelly. Got it. All yeah. Right, and, and the story of the company was amazing. So I got to meet Brian on a handful of different occasions. I got to, you know, get exposed to some pretty high names in, in the travel industry. Um, and so at that point, that was really Yoni where it clicked for me. Um, it was a combination of doing that 
internship working for the points guy. Um, and then at the time too, this kind of uh, all gets into the story. I was, I was traveling a lot and uh, I was part of the entrepreneurship club at the University of Florida, but I had never really gone to any meetings and I was on the Facebook group and they posted up that they had gotten these free tickets to the Lean Startup Conference in San Francisco by Eric Reis. And uh, they posted up in the Facebook group and said, hey, we got these free tickets to this event. Um, anyone who can get out there, the tickets are free. And so I didn't know who Eric Rise was. I didn't know who the Lean Startup was, but I was like, this is, sounds awesome. Like I can get a free trip out to California. I had a bunch of airline miles saved up. So I knew uh, probably no one would be able to afford the tickets. I knew I could at least get myself out there. So sure enough, I go out to the Lean Startup Conference. There's four of us kids from UF all packed into a room at the Fairmont. And uh, that was my first real exposure. Oh, sorry, four kids from who? From UF? What's that? Yeah, all from all University from of Florida. Uh huh. Uh huh. So it happened. Oh, so you flew together from Florida to the place, or you met them there? Uh, we just met them there. I'd never, okay. never met the people in my life. And Got uh, it. okay. You show up in the hotel room, and and this was my my big first experience into anything in the in the startup world, and uh, it was super interesting because over that weekend, right going around and you know everyone's coming up to you and pitching you their ideas for this company the startup that they're working on and you know it's just clicked in my head for a minute i i was saw very clear that my life was going in two different directions either i was going to double down and do this corporate thing um i had already been going through college and i was having some trouble with actually showing up and going to classes and then you know where it really clicked for me is when i um you know i remember i was helping the points guy and helping with some of their their facebook ad strategies and I remember going to one of my marketing professors and I said, hey, you know, what's an acceptable cost per click on this kind of thing, right? And Because I, I, I had never done anything with Facebook ads. And I very distinctly remember uh, the marketing professor saying, I don't really have any idea and you're not going to learn that until grad school. So up until that point, I was pretty invested and I was actually doing quite well in the business school. Um, but at that point, I was like, this is stupid. I'm not going to go and sit here and spend all this time and effort. If I'm doing something in the real world, we were managing like millions of dollars uh, I mean, just like huge amounts in these ad spends for the points guy. And so that's kind of where on where Facebook or also other uh, channels. Was it also Google, LinkedIn? What was your uh, channels that you guys used to advertise uh, the points guy? Back then it was all Facebook. So I'm out there at the lean startup and, and everyone is, you know, pitching me the ideas. I'm meeting all these other people. And I remember it clicking for me. I'm like, I feel like I'm at least as smart as these people. I feel like I'm at least as charming the difference between these people that are going and, and chasing their dreams and going and doing all these things. Uh, and then there's me, there's, I, I wasn't really invested in my academic career. Um, I, I caught some interest about what I wanted to do. And so that's kind of where it clicked. The other thing that really blew my mind, Yoni, is when we were there at the Fairmont, I have a very good memory of a guy who later became my business partner. So this is all going to tie in, but I was sitting in the bed uh, next to this guy, right? His name was Eric and he was working on his laptop and I, I look over, it must be midnight or something. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? He's got this huge Excel sheet. And he said, oh, this is a list of everyone at this conference. It's their first name, their last name, their title. And because uh, he was going, he was trying to find different people who would come and speak at the entrepreneurship club at the University of Florida. And so, he, you know, this must be a list of like 100 people with names, titles. And I was like, did you put that together? And he said, no, I didn't put it together. My VA put it together. And I said, what's a VA? Right. And then so at, it was a combination of like seeing other people that were going and living their lives and chasing their dreams. And then there was a combination of like, seeing that, wait, there's probably this whole world that I don't even understand all these tools and tips and tricks. And that's what turned out to be true. So after that, you know, learning out what a VA was, I started going crazy with reading the hundred dollar startup, reading the four hour work week, reading rich dad, poor dad. And then that's, that's really where things shifted for me. So the kind of where the story goes from there is um, I pretty much stopped going to class completely uh, at the University of Florida. The only reason I stuck around um, I told my parents, like I had take, I took like a semester off. I told them that I was still going to class and, you know, I really wasn't. The only reason I stuck around was because there was this business consulting team that the University of Florida had where they had these international consulting competitions where they send you, they would pay for you to go and travel around these world, around the world and do these consulting competitions. So I stayed around as long as I possibly could. But when my GPA dropped and then I got kicked out of business school, I wasn't allowed to stay on the team. Um, that's when I completely stopped going to college. I said, I said to my mom and dad, I said, look, I'm paying for this. I'm not going to finish. I know it's not what you guys want to hear, but this is what it is. And what year uh, is this? Uh, so this must have been like maybe 2016, 2017. All right. So 2016, 2017, you're still with the points guy. 
you're immersing yourself in the, the business world and the entrepreneurial bug is, is, is pounding you left and right, which ended up with you basically leaving your academics. What's the next station for you? Yeah. So the next step was I was working remotely for the points guy. I was making some income. Um, pretty much I wasn't going to class anymore. I'd, I'd completely withdrawn from all my classes. And uh, that's when I really started to, to travel a little bit. Uh, I was you know, working remote, getting a couple of different gigs. And then um, the last kind of step before, before things really shifted was I took a job with Amazon. I did over the summer, I did a summer internship with Amazon. It went really, really well. Uh, it was in a loss prevention role, which kind of sounds like the craziest thing, but I, I worked as an intern inside a fulfillment center in Tampa. That's where I started off. And uh, the internship went really well. In fact, while I was an intern, I was able to um, put together a white paper that got approved while I was an intern that put in x-ray screening into all of the North American fulfillment centers. So a lot of people don't know this, but when FC workers are going in and out, uh, they are actually, you know, they have to, you know, have their bags searched because people do steal things from the fulfillment centers. So I put together a whole paper and pitched it. And, uh, you know, that was like my, my baby. Anyway, when, after my internship was done, I ended up getting an offer with Amazon and, um, I told them straight off. I said, look, guys, and I, I knew a little bit of Amazon's background. In their and this is the summer right? of 216 or 17. This must be 17, I think. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Amazon, they, they give me a job offer and I say, guys, I'm not at all planning on graduating. I want to know, can I still work for you guys if I don't graduate? And they said, we don't care at all. It doesn't matter to us. You've done a great job on your internship. And so that was all I really needed. Um, that, at that point, that was when I completely told my parents, I leveled up and I said, guys, I haven't been going to college for the past year and a half. Um, there's no way I'm going to finish. I do have a full-time job offer with Amazon. They don't care if I graduate. And so this is what I'm going to do. And so um, they, they were fine with that. I mean, they knew that Amazon was a legit company, so there's not you know, too much that can be done. And uh, so I was gonna start full-time in fall. And the one last thing that I wanted to do before starting full-time in the fall was I wanted to set up an Amazon FBA business and set it up to make some passive income because I learned a little bit about FBA. Um, I'd seen other friends doing it. And uh, I knew that once I started working full-time at Amazon, I wasn't probably gonna have time to do much else. So before I started, I, I moved out to the summer, over the summer to the Philippines with uh, that guy from college, Eric. And, well, uh, why no, did he move though? I, I, I know you have a passion for travel. Yeah. It seems like you, uh, you, you, your ambition is to be the citizen of the world, which is cool. I, I commend that. But what was his angle leaving to, uh, did he take you along? What was the dynamics there? Oh, no, it was just, uh, uh, we have a small group of e-com sellers that usually for about, you know, maybe a two month period, we'll just take a time off and we'll just go and travel together. Um, so he, it was just like, hey, what do you want to do for three months? Like, let's go to Cebu, Philippines. Never had been there. Just no idea, but let's go check it out. What was the name of the town? Cebu. How do, Zubu? Cebu, C-E-B-U. C-E-B-U. Cebu. Okay, shout out to Cebu, Philippines. Is that near the, the capital at all or no? Uh, it's, it's, it's a quick flight. It's like the second largest city, but it's, it's the beach city. So you go there. It's like the equivalent of Phuket, I guess, for the Philippines. Uh, probably uh, phenomenal. Sounds phenomenal. Okay, so you and Eric uh, hit, hit the Philippines. What happened uh, over there? Yeah, so it was super good. We go out, uh, we, you know, I learned how to sell on Amazon FBA, super great, uh, launch a product. And, you know, we have a good summer, kind of get things, get ducks in a line. And then I moved back to the US um, to start a full-time job with Amazon in Houston. Things go really well in the, that first year. <laughs> I really don't have anything bad at all to say about working at Amazon. I really did enjoy the job. I loved it. So 2017, um, September, you know, a year in, you're, you're for a whole year, you, uh, you did in Houston, Texas. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah and yeah. the loss prevention, same role or? Yeah. Loss, loss prevention. And, and loss prevention is, is a really cool role because you've got this FC with like 4,000 workers. Right. And so a lot of people ask, they say like, do people, do employees actually steal? Do associates actually steal? And the answer is yes, they steal a lot. Um, and in fact, some, one of the biggest cases I'd ever heard of was there is a, and people get very clever with it. Uh, a guy actually in Newark, what he did is over the course of two years, he stole a quarter million dollars in iPhones. And how he did it is he had a lunchbox and every day on the way leaving the FC, your lunchbox is searched. But he was very smart because he created hidden compartments in his lunchbox. And so every day, like clockwork, one or two iPhones just walking out and over two years stole a quarter million dollars in, uh, in iPhones. How'd you so, guys find that out? What was the trigger for you guys? What was the red flag that made you say, oh, something's off here? 
Yeah, so that one, it, it was, you know, the, the, the crazy But you're used to what's, what's, uh, what I'm wondering, if you're used and how'd you find out about it? So that wasn't my FC. That was just the biggest one I have ever heard of. I heard of it, got um, it, okay. And, and inside my fulfillment center, we saw big ones. I've never seen anything a quarter million dollars as big. But the, the cool thing was, is that not only did you get to actually do the theft investigation. So like, imagine this, Yoni, this, this fulfillment center is like 4,000 workers. It's absolutely massive. It's just giant. Um, and every single time that something moves in the FC, it's tracked. And so a lot of what our job would be was we would have these investigations. We knew that something had been stolen, but we didn't know out of the 4,000 people, we could see that there was inventory deviations, but we had to figure out who did it and what was the extent of the theft. And so it was pretty cool getting to do the investigation work. I got put through like interrogation training. So like uh, it was like a multi-day course learning how to interrogate people. Um, I got to deal with some really cool scenarios. Like we had these huge, like even just at my site, we had a, a vendor fraud case where they were supposed to be selling, you know, a vendor, you know, cause they get paid up front for their inventory. Right. And so they were, they were reselling a uh, NVIDIA graphics cards that cost like 400 bucks a pop. And what this seller did, they were very smart is they sent out all of these packages that were a similar size and weight of these graphics cards, but they were putting just random items in it. So like lens caps, a deck of cards, whatever it might be. And by the time that they found out just at my FC alone was like a hundred thousand dollars and company wide was like $2 million. So some of the things would get really, really well, what happened? Big. So Amazon paid $2 million for bogus inventory basically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so they, they, they get, they collect the bill, but they send you bogus products as a vendor to Amazon, not as a third party seller. Right. And the thing that they were doing that was even smarter is, uh, and sometimes this would happen is what a vendor would do is they would preload, they would send a bunch of useless inventory, but then they would raise their price so that they would lose the buy box just with the intention of going until they get their payout. And then once, once it's, once they've been paid out, they don't care. They start releasing the inventory and then it gets caught. So it's very interesting. And what's interesting is that they gave you, um, the life experience to interrogate people on delicate matters. It's never a fun, pleasant thing to suspect anybody and you have to play that role. Um, and you did it. And I guess you did it successfully because you guys uh, did loss prevention. You, you prevented uh, more loss for Amazon, probably millions of dollars uh, throughout uh, a cycle of a year, which is uh, something I'm sure they appreciate, which is good. Uh, okay. What was your next station? What was the next uh, adventure? Yeah. So what was next is, you know, I, I love my job at Amazon, really, really loved it. The only thing that I didn't love was obviously you, you know, you don't get unlimited vacation. Right. And so uh, the travel uh, bug that, that, yeah, that was what really hit it for me. I remember I had come back, I had traveled a bunch just in that first year. I took a trip out to, to Egypt and then I had gotten back from that. And then I'd taken another trip out with, with my girlfriend at the time and some friends um, out to Bali. And I remember flying back on the plane from Bali. We were only there for about a week or so. And Eric, the, the guy I was talking about earlier was actually on that trip. So we went out, a small group of us went out and stayed in Bali. And I remember thinking on the flight back home, shoot, I'm not gonna be able to take another serious vacation for another probably six months until I could accumulate my PTO. And given I had like a, a good amount of, uh, paid time off with Amazon, but it's just nowhere near to what I was looking for. Anyway, long story short though, is that that was the only thing that I didn't like about Amazon. And so actually at the time I was even looking um, because my friend, Eric, the guy who had taught me how to sell on Amazon, he was living in the Philippines. Um, I had lived there. I was like, I mean, Houston was a great city, but I wanted to go and see the world. I wanted to travel. And so I was actually applying to, I wanted to do something international. And so I was actually applying to internal transfers within Amazon. I was trying to get out to Singapore. I was, I was literally going anywhere. I was like, you guys can put me anywhere. I just want to be somewhere international. And um, I got a call one day from Eric, the, the guy, and he had this graphics company called Virtuous Graphics. And I had actually helped to hire some of their original employees when I was uh, living out in the Philippines with him over the summer. And so I was very well familiarized with the business um, at the time. They had about eight employees and they just did photography and graphic design for Amazon sellers. And so uh, the real story is I was dating a girl at the time and we broke up uh, dating. And then I texted that guy, Eric, who had met her about a week ago when she, you know, she was in Bali. And I was like, hey, dude, I just want to let you know, Hannah and I broke up. And so he, he's like, hey, give me a call. And so I think he's like ready to console me, you know, make me feel better. And so we get on the phone 20 seconds and he's like, yeah, well, I just want to let you know, I didn't really like her anyway, but now that there's nothing tying you down, why don't you come out here to the Philippines and help me scale virtuous graphics? And I thought this is absolutely insane. <laughs> I was going to have to repay a huge signing bonus. Uh, I was going oh, to Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. A big signing bonus, a big relocation. 
Um, also, I had, you know, they gave me starting off 64 shares of stock, which obviously had invested. So pretty much walking away from, from it all. And, uh, but I cushion, knew yeah, they call it a cushion job, yeah, a cushion position, a cushion job. Um, you, 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 you bit the, the, the forbidden fruit of uh, becoming an entrepreneur. Yeah, exactly right. Yoni. And, and so I, I knew if I didn't do this, this was something that I was going to end up regretting for the rest of my life. And the really cool thing I liked the most about traveling which really took a lot of the risk off for me is I knew deep down if absolute worst comes to worst, I'm just going to come back and get another job. Unlike, cause I'd lived in third world countries. Like I didn't have to go back to a, a house that had a metal roof or a dirt floor. Like I was going to be just fine. And so I told my parents, I said, Hey guys, I'm, I'm going to put in my two weeks notice at Amazon. I talked to my boss and um, you know, I was like, Hey, if I totally screw up, can I come back and work for, for you guys? If, if I totally mess up and they're like, yeah, no problem at all. You're definitely rehirable. And so I put in my two weeks notice and um, about a month later moved out to the Philippines. Wow. That's, that's uh, insanely wild. You know, um, Amazon lost you for the moment, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. But you're coming back in your own version, own version of ways. We're going to get to that very, very shortly, hopefully. Uh, okay. So out of a cushion job, New World, Philippines. This time, I, I guess you're still there because you, uh, technically speaking, you you live in the Philippines, even though you got stuck here because of the COVID. Um, okay, and this is 2018, towards the end of the year. Yeah. Oh, not too, not too late. No, not too uh, long ago. It's pretty recent, about two years ago. So now we're touching the la the past two years. Take us into uh, virtual graphics. You said. Vir uh, virtuous graphics. Yeah. Virtuous graphics. Yeah. So I got out there. You know, and <laughs> I remember I had so little money. I actually didn't have any money when I first moved out there because I had to re, you know, just as you can imagine, expenses for leaving. I didn't have like the cash. I had to repay back certain things. So I remember literally getting on the plane, maybe like a few hundred dollars in my bank account and uh, fl fly to Manila. And, um, you know, I remember it was like the first night we were there. Uh, we go out to dinner and I remember, I don't know if you've ever heard of the company Empire Flippers. But uh, I had traveled to a couple different Amazon conferences, I think Global Sources. And I remember I had heard of Empire Flippers and their CMO, Justin, I had seen him speak before. And that first night I'm in Manila, Eric's like, hey, let's, uh, let's get, you know, let's meet up and uh, we'll go out to dinner. There's some local e-com guys in, in, the, in town. And so we go out and I remember nudging him. I'm like, dude, is this Justin from Empire Flippers? And he's like, yeah, man, just, you know, people hang out all the time. And their, uh, their director of marketing, Greg Elfrink, who's become a good friend at this point. And uh, it was at they that li minute. They live in the Philippines or they happen to be it, visiting? Uh, they're based in Ho Chi Minh City, but I think they were just visiting through. Ho Chi Minh City of Vietnam? Yeah, yeah. In Saigon. Wow. wow. So the expats, Americans living in Asia as well, yeah? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A so good see the whole trend. I see, I see I uncovered some sort of a uh, uh, Asian community out, out there. It's pretty interesting to go uh, check you guys out. But uh, the world has to set up with COVID first. Yeah, man. I'm I, So I'll, I'll tell you that that first night having dinner, sitting with the group, I was like, it just clicked to me. I was like, okay, I definitely made the right decision. This was good. Um, now, given I didn't have any money, I, was, I literally came out there to make $2,000 a month, which was like, you know, no money at all. But I knew it was going to be enough to live on. From but you were a partner. Night, you guys became partners? Uh, yeah, so I, I came on, uh, we agreed uh, on a salary and then, you know, a small equity, uh, uh, equity based on time and based on uh, hitting different performance metrics. Right. And so, yeah, so, you know, that, that first month, man, I, I remember I lived on his couch for the first month because uh, I didn't have enough money to get a place. And um, sure enough, we worked really, really hard. And, you know, the first- What, what was that, your role? What was your position? So I was just director of operations, right? The, you know, Eric was very much focused on his FBA business. And he said, look, this, this, you know, come in here and scale, scale this business. That's well, what do you guys do? Right? What's the business? Uh, what's the offering? What's the value? So the, the whole thing with virtuous graphics, what it was, was specifically am images and graphic design specifically for Amazon sellers. So unlike just a, a, a typical photo agency or a graphic design company, this was like, okay, there's going to be certain things in your images or in your infographics that on the Amazon platform, A, have to be compliant with TOS. But then on the other side of the equation, there's certain things that e-commerce um, that are actually going to drive clicks and drive conversions and actually get more add to carts. And so that was the whole angle. Shortly after I had got on, we added on video and copywriting. We wanted to be able to do absolutely everything for the listing. So if someone were to come to us, we could, we could knock it all out. And uh, yeah, that, that's what we really worked hard on. And for two years, like 
uh, really built it out, grew the team from uh, eight employees to more than 30 full-time creatives uh, in a span of two years, took our AOV from about $600 when I got there uh, to about $1,400 when, you know, when, when we left and uh, yeah, just worked really hard. AOV is what? Uh... Like an average order value. Yeah. Got it. So um, what, was the, what was the multiple there? So going from 600 to about 1400. All right, all right. More than double. That's great. And yeah. um, I guess like you mentioned, which I found interesting is that your claim uh, for fame was, you know, images optimized to the Amazon marketplace for third party sellers, which is uh, innovative. You know, you say this is this is our niche. This is what we specialize in. You hit the, uh, the, uh, the iron while it's hot because the growth has been hyper and it still is. So I guess it was a good decision to be at the right place at the right time. Yeah. And, and you made an impact. So you grew it. Uh, two and a half uh, about two and a half x on on the the average order value but uh and also on the physical level you guys you said five or six people on, uh, to 30 people you know and it was it was things too like we started off in the the studio we had was you know you know pretty crappy and then it you know we uh we upgraded to a much nicer studio where we had backdrops for you know different lifestyle shots like uh, bedroom bathroom things like that at that time i think uh, i guess you know between 24 to 25 years old uh, to actually have that opportunity to build a team that th that was that big and to be responsible for uh, revenue. Num like I never in my life thought, you know, I would see a single month with sales numbers of $75,000. Like it blew my mind. Um, but it was, it, was a, it was a super good experience because uh, Eric was very gracious to be very hands-off running the company. So I got to learn a lot. I got to make a lot of mistakes. And so it was like, I got to build this thing as an entrepreneur, but not, you know, completely like it was my thing which was a just a great yeah, you opportunity did, you didn't take the full exposure or the liability but um listen i'm connecting a small dot here uh, i don't know if you remember this but not too long ago you told me you saw yourself at some point in time as the cfo of the world so those numbers should not have been too foreign or too shocking uh for you once you hit them uh you know from that perspective but uh you did you know you saw these numbers as an entrepreneur like you said uh but you uh, in the back of your mind you did have a position as a cfo so i'm wondering uh you know, you made some sort of a closure there. You saw it as actually the guy who owns the numbers. You, you stand behind them because you generated them, which yeah. is unusual. So you're much more connected and affected by it. But I congratulate, congratulate you for that. It's a pretty awesome experience to, to feel. I'm coming with a few hundred bucks as a foreign country, as an entrepreneur. Um, we're doing, doing something innovative. But by all, it seems like all the KPIs, the key performance indicators of your story have been positive. And they, they, you know, directly show a growth or hyper growth in, you know, in a form of two years, uh, these multiples are great. They're awesome. Um, and uh, what, what triggered, I guess, the, the, the purchasing or the exit uh, move, which is, I guess, the next station in the story. But I want to touch before that a little bit. You mentioned that, you know, you find yourself 24, 25 years old, uh, you know, handling all these numbers. But how did you make you feel being responsible for the livelihood of this team, you know, for five, six people to around 30 people? And was this team mostly uh, a global team or is it more local in the Philippines? What was the dynamics of the actual team? Yeah, that, that was by far the biggest thing for me, right? Because, you know, first off, over the two years, it definitely wasn't all smooth. There was like a lot of hiccups and uh, a lot of points of getting really close to service-based business. Obviously, the margin is not uh, as big as a product-based business, you know, would be typically. Um, and so the livelihood was definitely the big one, right? We had people on our team, uh, our creative directors and, and just, you know, everyone on our team, right? We had, we had people that were parents, single moms, like every potential makeup, people that were supporting their parents, people that had, you know, a family member or loved one with disabilities. And it was like, if we, for some reason, didn't make the amount of money that we needed to cover payroll or something like that, like, you know, Filipinos on average don't have a ton of extra savings, right? It's not like they're going to fall back. Like it is, is like, f to be completely honest, you know, the difference of eating or not eating or their family eating or not eating. So that was definitely the big thing. That was definitely the thing that keeps you up at night of like, did we hire too much? Did we make the wrong mistake? Um, but at the same time too, I was really fortunate to have my business partner, Eric, who was a very frugal guy and he had been running businesses for, for years. So you are you know, guys almost the same age or no? Yeah, same age, yeah. But yeah, he's more of the, into the business experience and he's uh, more into the making sure there's a tunnel vision, especially on the cost level, keeping yeah. a good handle on it and make sure, making sure everything's aligned so you guys are, uh, are uh, steering in uh, steady waters. Yeah, yeah. And as well, too, offering some counsel where sometimes, I mean, there was definitely a couple periods over, over a two-year period where it's just like, 
I was completely overwhelmed and exhausted and was like, I don't know what we're going to do about this man. And he's like, dude, calm down. It's going to be fine. But you know, if you haven't been there that, you know, haven't been there before personally, I mean, you know how stressful this stuff can be. It can be really crazy. It's like absolutely nuts. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, the game of entrepreneurship is uh, one crisis after the other, uh, endless and constant decision-making. Uh, fatiguing on it sometimes but once you have the right balance of especially having the right partner where you can have a good shoulder on it and when you complement each other on on the highs and the lows i think that's awesome uh, that's a great thing to have and i salute you man this is you know you're doing it at a young age i'm not that old i'm only 36 but you start uh you started what 24 25 yeah that's a good age that's a good age uh, and you've seen a little you've seen i've seen things around a little bit you saw the points guy which is it, it was a scrappy company that became something that is worth mentioning around the world right now or at least in america i've heard about them and i know they're doing uh, they're up to uh, interesting things on the credit card level you work for amazon uh, you know a fortune 500 company uh loss prevention which is a very unique position to be in inside amazon I, i'm sure you garnered a lot of experience uh, and you, it, it, your, your life cycle is pretty versatile at this point, as far as I can, I can see. Um, and you have uh, in, interesting angles where you, sometimes you see yourself. You sometimes you see yourself as a doctor, as a CFO, um, uh, as a detective, right? And uh, also uh, this guy that's, that's, you know, the whole uh, world, you know, you have a whole world on your shoulders in terms of livelihood and of people. And as well, I understand from your words is that most of the team members were local in the Philippines, yeah? Yep, everyone, everyone was local, yep. Yeah, you should probably get a medal from uh, Duterte. What's his name? Yeah, Duterte. <laughs> Duterte, yeah. You should probably, yeah. I heard it has a nice uh, airline, I mean, an uh, airplane. So it may take you for a ride back uh, once you're ready to go <laughs> to the Philippines. Okay, so talk to me about um, the exit. What was the trigger there? What was the dynamics? What was that experience like for you guys? Yeah, so at that point, you know, we had been really scaling and we had really been growing a lot. And we we're kind of at this point of like critical, <laughs> you know, critical Thing, where it's like, we're going to go to the next level, right? And so my, my business partner, Eric, like I said earlier, was really focused on his FBA brands. He had been doing that. Uh, I'd say like probably 90% of his time was spent on that and just, you know, really helping out with virtuous graphics from an administrative perspective and, you know, making sure the bills got paid and things like that. And uh, I said, hey, look, you know, Eric, qu quite honestly, I really need someone else to come in here and, and help this, right? Because like, it was just, very quickly, it was going to become like way too much for me to do by myself. Were you the and COO, CEO, uh, the COO. official title? COO and he was CEO? Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think but he was, was yeah, yeah, but yeah, it's official title, but he also owns the business. But he said 10% of the time he was kind of with you guys, 90% he's running his brands on Amazon or he does also outside of Amazon? Uh, yeah, he was so just an Amazon FBA seller. And, um, and so I said, uh, at the time, there was this private equity company uh, that actually had some local members in Manila. And uh, they, they actually offered, you know, they said, hey, this could be a really good thing that Tony can get the help that he needs to go and scale the business. Um, the other thing too, is we were about to inject some serious capital into the business. So around uh, like building out a even better studio and bringing on like some serious level talent in the FBA space. So which funding uh, like, was your self-funded or from- uh, We were all self-funded, yes. So this would be the first time that we were going to, um, to actually take funding. And we had also had a, a time the previous year where we almost took investor money, but we ended up not doing it. And I look back and I, I almost regretted it because I was like thinking, what could I have done in that year if I actually had more resources, you know, to go and scale the business? So yeah, it was just kind of the right place, right time for, for this because the, 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 the buyer uh, offered to buy us. And it was very good for Eric because there was very little, very little requirements on his end in terms of his earnout. So like he could still focus. It was going to be a very smooth and easy transition. Um, and so, yeah, then he would be able to kind of double down on his FBA business and I would get the help that I needed uh, to, to help keep running and scaling virtuous graphics. All right. So this is a private equity group that came in. Uh, the, the dynamics was they're about to give you some funding, but instead they just bought the, the whole company out completely. Uh, I think originally we were we were going around some different options, but uh, the one that we ended up doing was they bought us completely. And uh, for them, the, the thought was partially for gains that could be made with virtuous graphics. But then the other half as well is because they focused on acquiring other Amazon FBA brands and, you know, making them better, improving them. And so the other benefit to them was now they were going to have access to the entire team 
for all of their brands to get. Yeah, it's what I call strategical uh, a strategic purchase, where um, you obviously get a, a thriving business, so that uh, ha that has its own merit and its own uh, upside potentially, and also if it's, it complements your uh, your other um, uh, I guess core business, which is for them is buying brands we sell on Amazon and optimizing them. So it falls into the wheelhouse. So this is definitely a strategic uh, purchase for them. So you, you sold out, your equity has been, you know, uh, uh, cashed out into in a liquidity event and more funding is in the organization. What happened next? So it was good. I helped over a period of about six months to, to transition out. Um, and, you know, things, things went, Went, went well from from certain circumstances like uh you know we i think it was, a, it was a pretty smooth handoff in terms of like keeping the trajectory of things going we we helped it through the transition and then um around january it wasn't like january you know, what, 2019 like, so, or 2020 uh this 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 january yeah this january you know, okay so and the last year was the the purchase yeah in september and then mm -hmm. by january uh i had helped with the transition they were they were in the spot that they needed to keep going and so it wasn't like I had <laughs> enough money to like not work anymore. Um, and so I take about a month off, just kind of relaxed. And then I was looking well, Hold on, for, you knew uh, the, the moment you guys uh, sold out, you guys, you knew you were going to leave or you plan to stay? What was uh, your mindset? Yeah, my plan originally was to stay. Uh, absolutely. That was definitely the thought. Um, what ended up happening in reality is I think um, a little bit more of a complicated situation, as you can imagine. Um, but it just didn't end up working out in the end, uh, in terms of me staying on there. I think we had very different ideas on the, the direction to take the company in, especially from, uh, you know, in, in regards to really focusing on Amazon sellers on Amazon third party sellers and like really honing that in. Um, but it just didn't end up working out. And, uh, so no, it wasn't decided that from the beginning. It just, it wasn't, yeah, it just didn't, didn't work out that I would be staying there. Got it. Okay. So three months, uh, passed by, everybody settles. You had, a, I guess, a liquidity event. It wasn't a, you know, not, not that you won the lottery, but you know, you're okay. You're comfortable. You took a month off, and what what bit you? Uh, so the the big thing is, I I I I had felt a little bit with the business selling the business that I was a little bit too short sighted, and I wish, you know, if I had to go back and do it again, I would have kept it longer uh, because I did really believe in the trajectory that we were going on, and now that. I really see it like two years is no time at all. Like I could have done another two years and it, it's like not, it's just a blip. So I was really looking for, I was like, okay, I want the next big thing, but I want something that I can do for the next five years. Right. I really want something. I, I didn't, I didn't feel comfort comfortable at that point in time, starting my own business. I knew I wanted to stay in the FBA space. I had like gone to all these conferences. I had spoken, I'd made all these connections. Uh, I talked to a few mentors and they were like, you would be crazy to leave the FBA space. You're, you would be nuts. And so I, uh, I put together a list of all of the, the companies that I would potentially want to work at. And like everyone was on that list, like Helium 10 was on the, like every major company in the FBA space. But the one that was always at the top of my list was PicFu. Um, I had known John and Justin uh, just briefly. We had met at Prosper Show in Vegas. We had done some collaborations at Virtuous Graphics. And in fact, we had incorporated PicFu as a, a pretty big component of our business at Virtuous Graphics as one of our service offerings. And uh, PicFu always striked, you know, struck me as this really, really valuable tool that not too many people uh, that was still kind of like a, a, a secret, right, in the FBA community. Like people almost wouldn't really want to talk about it because it's such a powerful tool. I'll be honest, up to, you know, I met you, which is pretty recently. Um, it was, I saw the name around a lot, don't get me wrong, but I didn't really kind of put the dots together. Uh, but once you did put it together for me, I thought it was brilliant. So let's take a moment here, take a fresh breath. And tell us what you guys do, and if if it I feel for the common seller that it's um a little bit uh, too rich, I'll sum it up in a few words. So they get the they, they get the, the 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 like an iron. Uh, what what's the what's the value here? But go ahead. Yeah, sure. So so PickFu is essentially just gives you access to customer feedback in just a matter of minutes. So essentially, especially for 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 uh, creative, right? For visuals, especially for images. Yeah, yeah. So, so you can do anything from testing, like if you're publishing a book, for example, you can test the cover of your book cover, right? Because if the cover's not good, no one's ever even going to get into reading the book. Similar use cases for mobile game development. So you can like, you, you could pick like uh, between two different 
avatars for a character and say which one is is better um, for advertising obviously e-com is a huge one so before you know your product packaging your logo your branding your images and so what PicFu allows you to do is it allows you to show these creative assets uh, to a panel that's more than 10,000 people in the US um, and you not only they not only vote as to hey I like option A or I like option B they give you detailed feedback as to why they chose that so that the use cases are, are, are pretty great, pretty big. Um, the reason that PicFu really stuck out to me and it was number one on that list is because exactly like you were saying, not that many people had really heard of it. If you think about how big this, all of these verticals and use cases are. And so also I had met Justin and John when I was in Vegas and uh, it was very clear that Justin and John were crazy smart guys. But when it came to uh, presentation and delivery, uh, that wasn't their strong, it wasn't, it wasn't their strong set, you know, and, and they would tell you that themselves or they're, they're, they're definitely a bit nerdy, uh, you know, nerdy engineers, but in, in a very positive way. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I thought there is huge potential in PicFu because the same, like it's just getting more and more competitive and e-commerce and Amazon, right? And the brands that will win in the end, uh, and we're seeing this happen already, but the brands that will win in the end are brands that ran their Amazon FBA business like it's a legit business. And that includes product development, marketing and strategy, but also like when Adidas or Nike or Under Armour, when they launch a product, they spend anywhere from $45,000 to $75,000 per product just in getting customer feedback, right? Now, the thing is for most Amazon FBA sellers, right? You're not gonna go and get a focus group. You're not gonna go and do, uh, you know, go with these big companies. You need something that's accessible. And so I thought the potential of where PicFu is going in the future, this more brands, it's gonna be like an essential part of every FBA seller. The ones that are successful is customer feedback. It's gotta be a line item. And it doesn't matter if it's PicFu or someone else, but you shouldn't be going with your gut. You shouldn't be going and asking your spouse or your partner. You shouldn't be going and asking a random stranger at Starbucks, hey, what do you think of my logo? You should actually have a more data-driven approach. And so- Yeah, data-driven where you, as much as possible, optimize into uh, asking your target audience. So that's what you guys are, are, are making a difference, I think, here is that you make it turnkey for sellers to test their creative on the, on the, on the target market. So you get you know, actual data from the target market, what's going to work for them, what's going to work less for them, and then you make an educated decision where to go, and that saves you a tremendous amount of agony, uh, and, and optimizes you to a level where you just launch it one launch after the other. You're just more successful. So you you that's a uh, I think it's a brilliant tool, and I think you guys are scrapping uh, the tip of the iceberg in terms of potential because it's, you know it's, it's it's a whole revolution out there, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs diving in you know every uh, every year to this uh, marketplace and launching new products. And like you mentioned, using their gut feeling, which is cool. But if, if you realize there's affordable solutions out there like pick food that can help you, you know, make it scientific, that's the way to go. That's where you know the right dosage is there and you made it and that's another view you, you mark. And then, you know, if you mark a few more uh, fundamental Vs and you're on your way for success, hopefully you convert uh, much, much better. And uh, you're, you'll, you'll taste the, the taste of success much faster because I think a, over, a big a chunk of them fail, and uh, this this the, pick food can be the difference between failure or not. Think about it. Yeah, you did everything right, but the images are just off, and you have a, a diff better option. It was just there, ready for you to, to know about it. Pick food is uh is, is there for for uh you know for you uh at your disposal. So uh so you do recommend pick food or uh, the similar to to uh, for the sellers to become almost like a must, a mandatory uh when you launch your products and and, and set new routes for your creative. Yeah, exactly. That that's that's a hundred percent right, Yoni. And uh, yeah, you know, to that point as well. Like most people who are selling on Amazon, they're already selling in a really specific niche. And so most of the people selling products, like I know some of the products I've sold, I am not that target audience at all. So it is it is a really uh, great way to get a different perspective and to re you know reduce those risks and you know to kind of avoid those errors and so that was like the reason pick food is at the top of my list i uh i thought that there was serious potential of what could be done in the next you know few years about really taking this thing and getting it in front of uh not just ecom but our other verticals as well uh which are expanding so uh, i put together you know at the time they had a marketing assistant position open up on their website and you know for me i don't i don't care about a title i just i just wanted to get my hands in the game and so i uh i applied for that and then i ended up having a meeting with Justin and John and then another one and another one and, and then making a whole presentation to them about what I thought I could do. And um, I've been doing it for about six months and it's, it's looks like some of it's starting to go in a really positive direction. So I hope to have some more uh, exciting updates maybe a year from now. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Very cool. Uh, I want to touch quickly just, I guess, what are the main challenges for you guys, you know, or for you maybe at the, the current position before uh, we kind of uh, wrap it up towards the, the conclusion of uh, this episode. So what are the main kind of challenges for you guys? The big thing I think we're really working on a lot right now is figuring out what content marketing strategy really makes the most sense in trying to hash that out and build it out. Um, I think a big thing that I know I want to go look more at is video, right? Um, all of this content that is being put out and, you know, putting it out in the, in the highest level possible, just what's the most effective way to, to really do the best outreach possible. Outreach for, for pick food to basically put the awareness out that you guys are available for the seller. So they pick up on it. Yeah. Getting, getting the word out there. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's the big one. Yeah, so basically on. you guys can't get enough. You guys are hungry for more and, and it's just a, it's a good positive, uh, outlook for the sellers who use you guys. So how, you know, we need to grow faster. That's a very, really good problem to have for, for, uh, most businesses. Uh, okay. Very good. So, I'm going to recap a little bit what we got, you know, around 2000, 2015, you kind of a university of Florida, you are trying to discover yourself. In the meantime, you score a job with the points guy. You get experience with uh, working with first starter, although remotely uh, with an emerging company and you pick up a, a lot of, uh, over, uh, over the years with that or over time with that. Um, you are able to, I guess, you go to this uh, event in California, kind of uh, change your life. You meet Eric, which uh, later on you had the whole, uh, partnership with uh, with uh, the design company um, essentially you score a job with Amazon right and once you do that you say that's it I'm out of school you show your parents that you know you can live a, a successful uh, business life or professional life without the education because uh, you simply you see a target you see that something needs to be done you go and do it um, you did pretty well with Amazon but you do have the passion to explore and taste the world and because of that that took you over to the Philippines uh, bundling up with Eric running two years, uh, uh, growing a uh, startup and, and experiencing an exit, which is uh, pretty awesome. And then saying, you know what, I still have the entrepreneurial bug. I still want to, you know, live around the world and I want to be part of a, a emerging company. So you, I guess I pick for this position you are right now, you kind of, uh, there's a, 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 a couple of components, a layer from your past uh, uh, companies because you have the industry, which is Amazon, which you work for. You have a, you know, a company that is fresh and young, like it used to be with the points guy. Okay. Uh, and you have uh, the visual that you're working with, which was like the graphics company. So you have like a myriad of all the other components that you have with all these other companies. Yeah. It's all bundled into uh, to PickFu. So hopefully within the next three to five years, you do uh, well with all the, the points of success that you have with other companies. So I wish you much uh, luck with that. Um, okay, two last things. If somebody wants to reach out to you and connect with you, uh, you know, give, give them a handle. Uh, and the last uh, thing will be, uh, what is your message of hope and inspiration for entrepreneurs out there listening? Yeah, I, I think uh, first off, if anyone wants to get in contact with me, feel free to reach out anthony at pickfoo.com. Or if you want to hit me up on Instagram, it's just at Anthony Kofran. Inspiration, motivation, I guess the big thing that I would say is, uh, re you know, really thinking about time and uh, regards to the process, right? Really respecting the process. And so I guess the, the big thing that I would say is like, if you want to go from point A to point Z, and you have these big lofty goals and these big ambitions for what you want to accomplish, what you should probably realize is that it's actually probably way less complicated to get from point A to point Z. There's just a lot of really small steps along the way, uh, but you can look at anyone else who's done something and you can follow their exact process on how to get there um, and you will be able to accomplish it. The one thing that I would say though is it's probably just gonna take a lot longer than you expect uh, and to have realistic time frames. I think a, a really good quote that I hear a lot is like people underestimate what they can do in a, in a, they underestimate what they can do in a week, but overestimate what, you know, I think you get the point, but you pretty much people don't tend to think long enough term on things. And so if you just admit to yourself that, Hey, this thing that I want to do, it's not going to happen in six months. It's going to take two years. And this is a plan of how to, to get there over two years. Uh, you'll find that all, all, a lot of these little, you know, ups, ups and downs, downs mm -hmm. are smoothed out over a long enough time frame. And uh, if, if you're feeling stressed or you're feeling anxious about that, then probably just push out your time frame or change the plan because there's probably an issue with one of those two things. All right, either change the plan or give yourself an extension. So, you know, take it one step at a time, but have patience. And uh, that's your, I guess, uh, message of hope and inspiration. Awesome. I like it. 
All right, Anthony, it's been a pleasure. It's been a very vibrant, energetic ride. So I thank you for that. Um, I wish you the best of luck. You know, uh, hopefully you'll get back to the Philippines uh, safely. And it'll be very interesting to see how you develop over the years. Uh, I'm going to put a, a, an eye out for you and also for Pikfu. Uh, thanks again. Anybody uh, watching or listening, thank you for uh, participating. Uh, all the best. Stay safe, stay healthy. Until next time. Thanks so much, Yoni. Bye-bye.